Welcome to another episode of Grace Under Pressure. Today, my guest is my colleague and friend, uh, Cynthia Burnham. Uh, LinkedIn, uh, excuse me, uh, this is a LinkedIn live show that we pose questions to thought leaders and doers like Cynthia, whose ideas and actions are helping us come to a greater understanding of ourselves, especially in crisis. Grace Under Pressure reveals what's too often dismissed as the soft stuff, you know, the stuff like caring, connecting, commitment, we feel toward one another. Grace for me is generosity we show, respect we give, compassion we demonstrate. And when you do it as a leader, especially during challenging times, it requires, uh, um, okay, excuse me, I'm just getting a, a warning notice here. Um, uh, it's Grace for me, it's, I'm sorry, excuse guests, we're getting a technical difficulty here. Um, anyway, uh, anyway, welcome, Cynthia. Um, Thank you. I wanna tell you a little bit about Cynthia. Um, not only is she my friend and a colleague of Marshall Goldsmith, uh, 100 Coaches, she's a master corporate executive coach. She's also board certified. She's a former Wall Street executive, a vice president, and the author of The Charisma Edge, how to, uh, the how-to guide for turning on your leadership power. Um, and I can attest to this. Um, Cynthia has been called life altering by her clients and because she has this deep personal mission to helping other people. And folks, if you think that you have a tough job, Cynthia is my peer coach. So, um, uh, so, uh, she's got the tough job anyway. Uh, Cynthia specializes in personal presence, leadership enhancement, and powerful communication techniques. She's really good at that. More, to, more than 30 years of experience. She got an MBA um, from a UCLA and, a, and an undergrad degree from University of California, Southern, Southern, excuse me, Santa Barbara, where she majored in creative studies. She's quite the writer and creator. She also sings and she is a yoga instructor and she lives with her husband, Paul, in uh, San Diego County up in the mountains. So welcome, Cynthia. So good that you could join us today. I am so delighted to be here, John. This is really a this thrill and it's always fun to talk to you even off camera. <laughs> That's good. Um, Cynthia, you and I have talked many, many times. Yeah. Uh, executives are under a lot of pressure. What are the executives that you work with telling you? So. The, the things that I'm hearing are pretty consistent with what everyone is feeling, not only the executives, except with a higher level of responsibility. A lot of the people are feeling they, they don't know how to collaborate in this environment. They don't know how to get the job done when they can't actually see people and have those casual conversations. And I'm having so many people come to me and they are finding that this is a time of personal reevaluation where they begin to question their own skills and ability to manage going future and saying going forward and say, what do I want to be in the future? So I've had some very interesting and very deep conversations with senior executives who really are trying to figure out who do I want to be in the world right now in this challenging environment. That's a fascinating talk. And we've talked about this topic yeah. to others, but it's an interesting perspective. What you're hearing from executives, is it self-doubt or is it maybe it's time, this is a sign I should do something different? Well, it, it depends on the executive because some executives have more self-doubt than others. Uh, some have less self-doubt than others. It's so it's, I'm, excuse me, I'm hearing both things. I'm hearing both, I don't think this is what I wanna do anymore or it's time for me to do something different. But it's also, I've been a leader in a physical environment my whole life. And I don't get this Zoom thing. And I don't know what I'm, I'm afraid that people are gonna see what, see that I don't know what I'm doing. So that imposter syndrome thing. And the other little side comment that I would make is one of the funny things about the virtual world is that everybody's the same size. And every voice is the same size because you just it's so so the virtual world is kind of an equalizer. So the hierarchy is getting a feels a whole bunch of reasons for that. The hierarchy feels like it's getting flattened. And so these people are feeling insecure because they don't know how to take their power in this world. That's, That's fascinating. What I'm and it, it yeah. um, because in, in a sense that while 
us coaches and talk a lot about don't equate leadership with position, I think a lot of people do. And so would you not yeah. agree? That? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And they they get a sense of security from the hierarchy. You, you only have to compare the average for-profit against an, a not-for-profit company or, or a volunteer organization to see that in the pro for profit world, you know you have the power to fire people. When you're working with volunteers, you don't. And somehow there's, there's some weird thing that's going on where the not the for profit world now feels like you have less power over your employees than you did, more like a volunteer organization. So there's some lessons to be learned in there, I think. I think I'm not sure what they are yet, but right. they're there. That's yeah. a fascinating topic. And um, it, you know, it gets to the whole idea of presence. So what is presence now when we're not physically in the same area? I love this question because it's really been a fascinating thing to watch unfold. I do think as an aside, I do think one of the things that's happening was just we're accelerating something that would have happened anyhow, that or or at least partially would have happened anyhow. So we just are getting our lessons a little bit earlier. So there's, I, I guess I would call good news and bad news around presence in the virtual world. The good news is a lot of the things still apply. Good posture, speaking in an organized and thoughtful way. Uh, making eye, knowing how to make eye contact appropriately for whatever culture that you're in, uh, looking like you're whatever a leader is supposed to look like, all of those things are the same. They're the same. What's changed, at least in my opinion, there, first of all, there's this, how do I set up my world so that I look professional? So you have to, you have to think about your environment. Uh, differently than you did in the past, uh, and whether you use a virtual environment or your own room, or you have to, I say you have to think about it as a set, as opposed to thinking about it as your house. So that's changed to have the have to have the awareness of your physical surroundings. And if you if you want me to do something ever so slightly fun, I will show you that my environment is fake. Would that Thank be you. okay? So I can't my my background is not conducive to having a professional look. So I got a folding screen and I stretched a sheet over it and I will show you, I'm gonna tip my screen up. You can see the top of the screen and my oh, fan. Horrors, horrors. <laughs> <laughs> and there's my picture and there's a parrot in the cage over there. And then you see my husband's drum set off to the side. So. Uh, so I made a decision because I, I didn't feel that I could adequately re represent my work and the things that I wanted. So I, so the first thing is to think of your environment as a set. The second thing is to recognize that, that equalizing factor that you, you are not, everybody looks the same on camera and to think about, uh, using other ways to get into making a connection with people using your language or your your expressiveness, for example, uh, it, it helps more with presence. That matters more with presence when you're on screen than it does in person. The other thing that you, I think, you would really like this this comment. The other thing is there's this weird, weird juxtaposition of real and unreal going on. So bear with me. So. On the one hand, you are less real because you're on screen, you're 2D, you're, we know intellectually that we're distant from each other. On the other hand, we're only 18 inches away from each other. So there's this increased sense of intimacy that can be, that is there and can be worked with to create the collaborative environment. So though that's kind of an overview and I have thoughts on everything, is that, Kind of what you oh, it's wonderful! Out. I love this because it really gets into the 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 tangible nature of where we are right now. Yeah. And yeah. I just wanted to go back to this. Um, while we're all this great equalizer, it's right. that's where a leader's self confidence comes in. And I think what I'm sensing from you is from some folks in a leadership position, a little bit of the imposter syndrome, which is not yeah. unhealthy. 
Um, no. So how do you how do you help them work through that? Uh, well, it depends. I always the answer is always it depends on the person. <laughs> uh, a lot of <laughs> uh, 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 first of all, you know me, John, and I'm really about practical solutions. I don't. I, I love the conceptual stuff, but I really always want to come back to a practical thing and say, what can you do or what can you think about that's going to make this easier for you? And a lot of the times it's just challenging them to really re-examine if they're telling themselves the truth. And do you know what I mean on that? Does that sure. make sense? Sure. Yeah. And I like, you know, I'm, I'm glad you talked about um, practical solutions. Um, yeah. Neither one of us are academics. Um, you have one difference that I, from me, uh, well, many differences, <laughs> except, but you have been a, a, an executive and a senior yeah. level executive. So you have uh, been in the saddle. So you bring that dimension to it. So your solutions, I believe, are just rooted in, I'll say, common sense. And I, that's not being dismissive. It's just being sometimes... Uh, the answers are right in front of us, are they not? So. Yes. That's, that's a great point, John. That's wonderful. Because what I, so I was a, the senior vice president of employee relations and learning for a, a UBS financial services on Wall Street. And to give myself a little credentials, there were about uh, 200 odd senior vice presidents out of 20,000 people, and there were only 44 women. So I feel very, very proud of what I was able to achieve in, in that time. And I really feel that the, the differentiator does come down to that common sense and practicality. Because if you're talking to the president of a 20,000 person division and you don't bring him something workable, you're not gonna be there. So I, I really do want people to find those practical solutions about things. And I think that's that's one of the things that my experience gave me. I don't get all academic on stuff, except I do get thrilled about the brain and I'll start going on and on about the brain. But it's really more about, how, you gotta look at the engine if you're gonna try to fix the car. And so you gotta look at the brain if you're gonna try to work with people. So I do go with that. Absolutely. Does that answer your question? Uh, no, it does very much so. And so us, we, us coaches, we debate at times. Um, we have to listen, we have to observe. What role does advice play in our role, Cynthia? Uh, well, I'll tell you what advice, the role that advice plays in my personal chosen role. Most of it, if I am in a situation where I believe that I think the person either has to investigate the personal reasons within themselves. Like, what is my greater purpose? What do I want my role to be? What do I want my job to be in the future? All of those kinds of things. Those are to me, that's where I spend my time, what I call coaching, asking questions, because those comes from inside themselves. Then on the other end of the spectrum, and I'm willing to go there because I think of myself as a leadership consultant, even more than a coach, Sometimes I have more knowledge about stuff than you do. And you're not going to uncover it by my asking you, well, have you considered this? Have you considered that? And by the way, my senior executives think that's wasting their time. If they know I know the answer and I'm not telling them. And in that capacity, I will say, this is what I've seen work in other situations. This, here are some ideas you might think about. Here's the academics behind it, any of that kind of thing. And then there's a spectrum in the middle where you can kind of go either way. That's sort of the way that I look at it. And sometimes I'll just say to somebody, you have to stop doing that. Don't do that anymore. Right. And and it, it's cutting to the chase. And yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. sometimes, you know, and you and I echo the same philosophies on our coaching. And fortunately, there's an organization that uh, sponsors or believes in that. And that's created yeah. by our friend C.B. Bowman and the Association of Corporate Executive Coaches. And many of the coaches there have behavioral science backgrounds, but folks like you, uh, corporate backgrounds, and folks like me who are in between. Um, and uh, we all believe in beha essentially behavior-based uh, coaching, but we also um, step in when it's in our own wheelhouse um, and we see a practical solution. 
Uh, and so it's good to explore the different dimensions of what executive coaching can be. So, so. yes, especially now get back to this um, questions of, we talked a little bit about the self doubt, but um, mm -hmm. so what's, what, uh, what's next for me? In other words, I've been a corporate executive for 20 years. I've worked my way up and now in this pandemic, it's not what I want to do. So what kinds of things are you hearing? They want to, open a, a, a B and B. Well, you can't do that right now, but uh, move to a cattle ranch in Montana. Oh, what are the kinds of things or just in a quandary? So, yeah, the, I am hearing, I am hearing people who say I've decided that when this is over, because a lot of people are that, that tagline comes into it. When this is over, I want to do something else. And a lot of the things that I'm hearing are they want to go into business for themselves or they want to go to work for a different kind of company that they're, they're, they're watching. Some companies are doing really well with this in terms of the culture that they have. You know, they're holding on to their, as you say, I have your quote that I wrote down from something you said the other day, when in crisis, go to your values because values are the things that keep us together. And there are companies where that's working really well. And there are also companies where people are going, I've just decided this company doesn't have the same values that I do. And so I am beginning to look for a company that has more values that are consistent. So people are, it's that overlap between questioning my values and questioning myself. That's, that seems to be happening. Well, I think uh, in a good crisis, way. Yeah. crisis provokes um, a value proposition. You know where you stand um, though. It's just, as it does with leaders, you know, how, uh, one will react in a crisis by being in a crisis. Um, right. and some revert to type, others take that mantle and do something different. Uh, and um, there's room for all of it. But I'm, I'm glad that I think uh, you and I agree that crisis can provoke opportunity. So, and that's something, did you discuss that with your clients or so? I, I absolutely, absolutely. And I'm kind of laughing because Unfortunately, most of us, self-included, most of us will not make a change unless there's some sort of a crisis point that happens. We are, generally speaking, not everyone, generally people are kind of risk averse and they wait until it becomes inevitable before they make a change. And this pandemic has increased that sense of inevitability in a lot of people that it's inevitable that I make that change. Does that does that resonate? Does that absolutely seem right? Yeah. Something yeah. else about the crisis that, in some ways, I think in organizations may not be focused on. We've discussed it in this program with a couple of folks, and I know you and I have discussed it. And that's the concept of loss. Um, mm, um, yes. That's that. Yes, uh, folks. Um, 160 million, or excuse me, 160 thousand Americans have lost their lives. Yes, yeah. but there's another kind of loss, and that's the loss of my maybe my identity. Do you sense in that? So. Hmm. Or at least a loss of my yes. colleagues, loss of my, where am I? Who am I? Yeah. That, yeah. The, so the way that I, the way that I look at it and I see, I think in visual images, so I'm going to go there a little bit. The first thing is the loss that I see most is the loss of my imagined future. And I've told people, I think I've told you this, John, I am working really hard to give up my deeply held delusion of predictability. And that is a painful loss for a lot of people. And it, by the way, it's forcing a lot of people into denial and doing things that are not necessarily healthy for themselves or their com communities because they can't face that, that loss of predictability and that loss of their imagined future. So if I lose my imagined future, I also lose my sense of myself within that imagined future. And so there we are. And I think of the way that I compare it, and I, I say this about almost all, all crises, hopefully this will make sense, is I imagine that we have all built an arc uh, or an arch of my own world and my values and everything around us. And it's sort of this big wall and we're standing in this big arch way that is how I feel about love, how I feel about religion, how I feel about this. And so every brick in the wall is something like that. When a crisis like this happens or any major crisis, frankly, divorce, death, 
changing jobs. It's like someone has reached up and pulled the key, the keystone out of that arch and everything comes tumbling down. And then you have to pick up every darn brick and say, okay, what do I feel about religion? Okay, what do I feel about my family? Okay, so crisis provokes that drop down and rebuilding of that. That's my vis just visual image. For oh, that. what a wonderful concept. I love, I love the image of the keystone. So, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I think you have so, an art background. It's a COVID, <laughs> COVID keystone, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, we talked about this and one of the things I say is that um, I think what will shape our future will be our values. And I, I want to say that the values we held in January 2020 will be the values that help us create our new normal. Do you have a comment on that? So We could have 15 shows on values, John. <laughs> uh, one of the things that I think has come into this is that people are now facing up to the fact that they have not been living their values in some cases. And so they're, they're now saying, as I said before, when I come out of this, I want to be able to live my values. And I, therefore, I think it's incumbent upon all of us as coaches to really spend time going deep with people at this time and saying, what do you really want? Right. What do you want your legacy to be? What do you want when you're lying on your deathbed? And you're, you had another guest who had a great question who said, uh, what do you want people to say behind your back when you're 90 years old? I, that was I Paul. Thought, what a great, what a great comment. Right. And I would also say to people, that is the big driver and then how does your work fit in that? And, and, and really as coaches and as people to try to use some of this time to, to say, what, what is my life? You know, what do I want my life to be? Right. Our friend colleague, uh, Marshall Goldsmith talks about the, if only, you know, when this, mm. happens, I'll be this. And when I finish that, I'll be that. And, and I think what you, you know, I think all, I mean, it's a human reaction, you know, um, and there's some comfort in that, but at the same time, and I like the way you're saying, Hey, let's focus on the now so yeah. that you can get a hold of it. Because what the, what Marshall's concept leads to is procrastination and just pushing back. Yeah. Well, and it, I guess, yes, the and to that is, and you get, if you really pay attention and think, what am I supposed to be doing in this world? Even the, the smallest person has some job in the world that they can be doing different. Everybody has a unique value. And if you can live that every day, then you get extra credit that makes you feel good and makes you be able to take larger steps. I'll give you an example. My role in the world is to act as a conduit for information to get from one part of the universe to another part of the universe to the person who needs that information and understanding. So that my job is to be a conduit. And as long as I am accumulating information, which then goes back out to my clients or understanding in some way, then I'm doing my job in the universe. So if I can get to the end of the day and say, did I do my job as a conduit for information? Little bit. A whole bunch, then I can then I can go to sleep at night and feel like I have lived my values. So to really think about what what is my unique value, and everybody has it. And some people say, "Oh, I don't have one." Everybody has one. It's a good thought. I I would push back a little bit on your idea of a conduit as it opposed as it pertains to you because you take information and present yeah. it as a teacher um, and yeah. as a coach you interpret and you focus it and you put your own spin on it. I don't, I don't mean uh, in a way that makes it understandable, tangible, and practical. I will say that about my you. Hope, yeah. so, my hope. Yeah. yeah. And by the way, something happens in the conduit, which is me. So I do, I, there is some cooking going on with there with the information, but I'm uh, I, you talk about moments of grace and I, I think about grace for me, is the uh, when you are aligned, the present moment and the requirements of the present moment are in alignment with your skills and understanding and your greater purpose. 
If you have all of those three things aligned, then you will feel grace. And that, and, and I love that you talk to people about grace because those moments of grace are what creates a sense of having purpose in the world. That's a beautiful uh, statement. I, I like to say that purpose Thank is you. our purpose is our why and grace becomes our how. And you just gave a perfect definition of okay. the how. <laughs> All right. and, um, and I'm I'm glad you put that at the an outcome of grace is yes. connection. And I think you talked about yourself being a yeah. conduit. Another word for that is a connector. Uh, mm-hmm. and you and you are that connector. You are sharing oh, you, sharing space, if if only virtual <laughs> at this point, um, with others with the intention of helping them come to their own understanding of self. So. Right, right. I, I I've I've t- said this to you before. When I am on my deathbed, I would like to be able to say, some people live happier lives because of the work that I did. That's it. Yeah. Some people. And and I think if all of us can take that's a that's something for almost everyone to be able to want to say. Yeah. You know it's I'm glad you say that because our colleagues um Chester Elton and mm-hmm. and and uh, Adrian Gostick have a new book out leading with gratitude. And part of gratitude We think of gratitude as saying, you did me a favor, Cynthia, and I say, I'm thankful for you. Or maybe you didn't do me a favor. I'm just thankful for your presence. There's another attribute, and it's what you're getting to it, and I know it's what you bring to it, is you are grateful to yourself. Um, I don't think that you can express gratitude unless you feel good about yourself. And when you do, that opens the door to giving to others. And it doesn't have to be, you know, um, you know, making a ten thousand dollar donation. It could simply be sharing space with someone else. You know, we all have a capacity to give of ourselves. And by the way, I, I, I take even one step slightly back from that, and I say, and so that's so much. I'm grateful for myself. I am grateful for the gifts that I have. Yeah, I'm yeah. grateful for the gifts that I have every moment. And uh, well, every moment that I can remember, because they're <laughs> trust me, I have my moments of what I call the three a.m. Uh, crazies. Or the same eight. Don't say that. So <laughs> yeah, yeah the, I call them the three a.m. Cra- crazies. So yeah. where you wake up and berate yourself for all the things that you didn't do. So. <laughs> but I, I have a really cool technique that I've been doing recently, John. That's so much fun. Sure, please share. This is to drive myself to remember how lucky I am. And what I do is I get up every morning and I take a picture of the light, of a chair, of something pretty in my environment. And I live in a pretty place, so it's pretty easy. And I, or something that I'm grateful for. And I post it on Facebook and I say, this is my, this is what I'm grateful for this morning. And what it does is it starts my day out being grateful. And I need, I need that right now because there's a lot of things that weigh us all down in this time and personal professional things. So if you can find those little things to do to drive that gratitude and that grace, then it'll, that makes everything easier for you and for the people around you. I'm so glad you talked about that because that is, it's something simple. It's human, it's tangible. And we all have the capacity to do little things like that. And it brightens someone else's life. But even as you said, hey, it makes me feel better. Right. You feeling better about yourself enables you to do your work, enables you to be the conduit, to be the connector, to be the teacher, to be the coach. And that's important. Um, we have to take care of ourselves because if we don't, who's gonna? So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, those uh, that old put on your your own oxygen mask first really comes into play. And by the way, that's another thing that I'm seeing is a lot of people who are burning out because they're not taking the time for self care. Right. You and I have talked about something that I'll just bring up here is another another practical tip. We've talked about this that that we underestimate the value of the little spaces. Walking down a hallway or sitting in a waiting room or driving your car or just 
uh, the time that you spend going to the walking to the restroom in a in an office building, all of those little spaces to detach from the pressure are gone. So we have to rebuild those as well, put them back into our lives. That's so important, and I'm glad you did that. And that's the how do we the, the call them micro connections? If you yes, want. And, yeah. Um, and how do we restore that in our world now when yeah. we're all living virtually? Um, Cynthia, this has been a wonderful conversation. Thank, thank you. you John. I, I always thank learn you. from you. Thrilling. Yeah. That's well, thank why, you. And uh, same back. That's Absolutely. why you're my peer coach. You have the tough yeah. job. I got the easy stuff. I just have to listen. Oh, no. Um, well, I don't listen. So <laughs> you have a, actually a tough job because I don't, I may not listen to you. So, <laughs> um, so Cynthia, how can people find you? So. They can find me at uh, Cindy at Cynthia Burnham.com. They can find my website at Cynthia Burnham.com. Very simple. It's just my name. They can find my book. And here's a copy, The Charisma Edge. You can find it, uh, Kindle or, Har or Softback on Amazon is the easiest way. Although I think I'm also on Barnes and Noble. And uh, hopefully, uh, they can find me on LinkedIn, obviously. And hopefully sometime in the next year or so, I will have another book out on the techniques that make storytelling impactful that you can then reintegrate back into your presentations and your ways of connecting with people. Thank you. And I will endorse that storytelling because I have shared it with a client and he found it of great value. So oh, thank, thank you. you so much. You. Um, and with that, we're going to um, close our show. So.